You're welcome back. It's now time to lift from off the press uh, the headlines that made it to the front pages of our national dailies. Uh, this morning, uh, we have joining us uh, Mr. Tunde Kolawole, uh, who will be addressing some of these issues uh, with us this morning. Tunde, good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning, thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, there are very, very interesting headlines this morning uh, that uh, we are going to be looking at. Yeah, very interesting ones. And um, uh, by the way, Tunde Kolawole is a, a legal practitioner and is talking to us from Lagos here. Well, uh, Tunde, let's begin with uh, headlines on uh, daily trust. That's, that's where we're beginning. Oh, rather, the leadership. The leadership is where we're beginning uh, this morning. There are two headlines there. One is... Um, uh, a sponsored one, or yeah, that's how they called it. It's a promotional one. They call this promotional. But the first one is federal government back battles market forces to stabilize petrol pump price. And then there is Hadi Sirica's eight years of waste. Let's begin with federal government battling market forces to stabilize petrol pump price. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the, the, the truth of the matter is that. Um Anyone who goes to the market, and that day is there anyone who doesn't go shopping at one time or the other, you find out that prices have poor drop and the so called regulation of the petroleum products, food items, cost of transportation, household material, even schools are now increasing school fees because they must also recoup. Whatever additional expenses that they are, in, that they are in, incurring from some other places. Uh, these are the challenges that uh, ordinarily is usually dictated by market uh, forces. Because if you say it's the market that is going to determine the prices of goods and services, and you are not producing anything in your country, you are virtually importing everything then you most likely face the kind of challenges that we are facing as a nation today. Why I have always said it, that the peak where everything is left to the vagaries of market forces. So the government in power today will require to look at this area to stabilize the Naira your account is Okay, um, we will have to wait a little bit before we can rejoin with uh, uh, Tunde Kolawole, a legal practitioner, talking to us from Lagos here. Um, now, um, we were trying to address some of the topics on the, uh, on the newspapers, that is the, the headlines on the newspapers, and we were talking about the leadership. Let me just reel out some of these um, headlines that are on the papers. On the leadership, we have battles, federal government battles market forces to stabilize petrol pump price, which uh, he was dealing with before uh, we went off. And then Hadi Sirica, eight years of waste and the writing about the aviation sector, which uh, was on its knees because of uh, the, um, the, the, the way it was handled by Hadi Sirica, the uh, Minister of Aviation then. Okay, I, I understand Tunde Kolawole is back. Tunde, welcome back. Welcome back, thank you. Yes, we were talking about battling market forces uh, to yeah, stabilize yeah, petrol yeah. pump price, yeah. Mm. So I, I would uh, want to conclude by saying that uh, the federal government has a lot of work to do with regards to uh, showing up or making sure that the Naira improves in value, that they will have to work on bringing down inflation. And then, of course, too, they will need to revisit this issue of disregulation of the petroleum products. There is nowhere in the world where market forces are allowed to determine the root of the economy because petroleum is at the root of our economy. Everything that we do in this country 
virtually depends on it. Because we are a mono economy, we are not producing anything. So that's the advice to the federal economy. With regard to Adi Silica, and honestly speaking, the editorial by leadership newspaper is merely saying the truth. We had an education minister where you find out the country has never done well in the area of aviation. The Nigerian Airways that they said they were going to bring it back, they didn't bring it back. They say it will come Under back in September. Too, the federal government are unable to meet its obligation to the foreign airlines that are applying the Nigerian airspace. So, and to watch the situation, few hours before the departure of the last uh, administration, they said they had uh, been able to refloat the Nigerian Airways. But that has now turned again to be a hoax, a deceit, for which the Nigerian people are paying heavily for. Evasion fuel, the price of evasion fuel remains the highest in Nigeria when compared with the other West African countries. And of course, too, most of the local airlines that are flying the local routes are not doing well. What they do is just epileptic service for the Nigerian people. Furthermore, as big as Nigeria is with regards to the private jets that so many of our allies have, Nigeria still doesn't have the standard anger where aircraft can be maintained. So if we have to maintain aircraft, we either take it to Ethiopia or you take it to South Africa. These are problems that the former Minister of Aviation ordinarily should have been able to, to, to look at within the eight years that he was in power. But lo and behold, the minister and the government that he serves were unable to help Nigerian people in these areas. So to that extent, one could say that the editorial by leadership is merely reflecting on the obvious. But we have been told that uh, the Nigeria Air will come up in September, just like a lot of things that we have been promised will start working. The refineries will start working by December, but uh, the <laughs> Nigeria Airlines will start uh, operations by September. September is just around the corner. Uh, only that we are worried, we are worried that um, uh, Nigeria Air will come up in September. Refineries will come up in December. Dangote was supposed to start operations by June, and this is August. So we don't know whether those things, all the things that we are being promised, will ever work or they will not work. Well. But if they will work, the people promised us would have been laying the foundation mm. for those things. But truth of the matter is that uh, no foundation is being laid for some of these things to work. You will recollect that a year or two before President Buhari left office, a dual contract for the turnaround maintenance for the application of the refineries were done. And we were being told at that period in time that those refineries will come back to life. But lo and behold, the refineries haven't come, haven't come back to life. And the Dangote refinery too, just like you have just said now, will most likely not work until the year 2026. Mm. So we are in many goals. Mm. And um, God help us if nothing is done, not just about the Dangote refinery, but also the rehabilitation of the refinery that belongs to the Nigeria federal government. It's a very sad situation. And the airlines aren't uh, living up to expectations, especially given the challenges that we have at hand. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, let's move on to daily trust. Um, we have 
some headlines that are similar to uh, the ones we've just talked about. But on Daily Trust, we have um, uh, families cry out as food prices hit rooftop. Uh, we also have Niger. ECOWAS insists on sanctions as northern elders demand withdrawal. Then after Tinubu, CBN governor's meeting, dollar crashes to 790 naira at parallel market. And terrorists claim responsibility for helicopter crash. NAF investigates. Uh, but I really want us to begin with this headline, President Rules Out Plans to Restore Petrol Subsidy Hike in Price. Uh, we remember that uh, it has been on uh, the internet that the, the federal government is considering this to return at least partially the fuel subsidy because, like you said, everything in Nigeria's economy has uh, oil as its roots. And now it is happening the way it is happening. So, but, but the federal government has said that will never happen. Meanwhile, we've seen that a country like Kenya, for instance, did the removal of fuel subsidy, and they've just returned it because they've seen that the country is suffering more than it is gaining. So Nigeria is saying that they cannot go back on their words. I'd like your comment on this. Mm. What is when you are running a rental economy, such as we are running, you are faced with a lot of uh, dilemma. You and I will remember that all this removal of subsidy from this, remove subsidy from there, don't give your people subsidy. As dictates of the IMF, the World Bank, and the for, for, I mean, the colonial masters, we are as they provide subsidy for their own people in the area of agriculture, in transportation, in education and world and so. These same people will dictate to their former colonies, or to the world world country, or to those countries whose economy is based on rent, not to give subsidies to their own people. And our leaders, without scrutinizing those in parallel, will just follow who climb and think up the dictates of their foreign master. So the chicken has come home to roost. We have removed the subsidy. And all of us can see the consequences of that removal. The crash in the value of the Naira, skyrocketing of prices, not just of food items, but of basically all goods and services in the market. So, Nigeria might find it difficult to do like it has happened in Kenya, even though that would have been the appropriate thing to do, for the simple reason that um, Nigeria is next deep in debt. We are told that the last government left a debt of between 20 and 30 trillion dollars. So if you have that kind of uh, debt in your hand, and you are no longer making enough money to even pay staff salary and emolument, you are bound to find ways and means to really raise money. I should think that is the reason why they have looked into the area of the so-called subsidy and have decided not to say to remove it so as to be able to find money to run government, to run the society. But right. like we have always said on this program, the subsidy is the only way to get money to run government. The answer is no. Cost of contact is still high. Cost of governance is still high. There is still a lot of loopholes in tax administration. And of course, so many people have collected taxes for the federal government, for the state government, which have not remitted to the government. So, one would have expected the government to look at some of those areas before removing subsidies. One would also have expected that we would put a palliative on ground before removing the subsidy. And very interestingly, Pastor Bakari said he learned one or two things from uh, Lady Inka, I mean from Lady Odumake, mm. uh, with regards to the meaning of palliative. The palliative is described in the dictionary as a kind of uh, management of a problem or a disease 
that has no permanent solution, that you just manage it until the eventuality comes to, to play. So the palliative that they give him, they just to stabilize the situation, is never a solution to the problem. So, Kenya is able to do it. I'm not too sure that uh, the governing uh, allies in Nigeria will be ready to commit a class suicide, seize the bull by the horn, and do the needful. But are, are you really sure the government, are you convinced that the government really wants to save money to do whatever they want to do? Because um, now, fuel subsidy has been removed. It doesn't show that the people in government are feeling it because they still are living flamboyant lives. The other day, we heard of prayers that were sent to inboxes of the senators. And some people are coming out to defend the senators and saying to give two million to a senator is nothing. It's just, it's just a, a family man given two million. What does that mean? Forgetting that the same people are the ones who are approving that a whole family should be given 8,000 naira. So I did some calculations. Two million naira divided by the 8,000 naira will be like 250, which means for the two million that is nothing to a senator, it has paid 250 families for one month. Or it has paid one family for 20 years. Every month, that is 12 months for 20 years, it will pay one family. But it's still nothing. It's just prayers to inbox. They're talking about NYSC, that the cost is too much, and they're looking at whether it is relevant. They want to scrap it because the cost may be too much. NYSC, everybody earns, let's say, 30,000 naira as a core member. A core member's salary, 66 of them will divide 2 million naira, and it will still be... Uh, so every, every, every 66 people, or uh, every senator took the money of 66 core members for one month, or 250 families for one month. And they're calling it uh, just small money, two million naira. Do you think the federal government really intends to cut the cost before, and they're still doing what they're doing? Buying bulletproof cars, doing so many things that Nigerians are just looking at them, and we say, we are peaceful people. Do you think they want to save money? Well, I don't think so. And it's just like you have rightly said, our allies, whether they be in the field of politics or in the private sector or in the civil service, they have always lived on the rest of society. Their accommodation is free, their food is free, their transportation is free. They don't go to the kind of market that you and I go to. So to that extent, the impact of this deregulation of the general product will never be felt by them. When inflation rises, what they will merely do is to increase their own allowances, salaries and emoluments, and provide other parasite of office to themselves. They are living like a colonial master or expatriate uh, administrators, such that whatever crimes you and I make, they will never understand. Take for example, Somebody has once said that the 8,000 naira is enough mm. to improve the lot of the average Nigerian person. That in fact, 200 uh, naira or 250 naira is enough to turn around the life of an average Nigerian person. Mm. So, their own economics. Is different from your own economics and different from my own economics because the shoe really doesn't pinch them in the leg. It is you and I that it pinches. So they are never likely to have anything to do with their own privileges. Rather, it is the ordinary man on the street that they will continue to force to tighten, to tighten their belt. As regards the NYSC, the question will be, 
what Nigeria gets from NYC and the cost of running it, which one is higher? I would want to say that the value that NYC confers on the average Nigerian youth is such that it is so beneficial that that should not be a program that should be scrapped. Remember, it was once pointed out that all the programs that people like General go on is suited while he was in office as the leader of state. The only one that has stood the test of time is uh, the NYC. So when people say they want to scrap the NYC, you ask yourself, why don't they scrap the Nigerian army? Why don't they scrap the Nigerian police? Why don't they scrap the DSS? Because these are also military institutions or organizations that uh, consume a lot of money. So if you are not scrapping those institutions, I don't see any reason why people should be calling for this scrapping of the NYC. Also remember or note that the NYC is the first bite or the first taste or the first feeling of being employed that this youth will go to when they did the, when they did the polytechnic and the colleges of education. So now you deny them of that benefit, you begin to wonder. Furthermore, it is the NYSC that gives some civic orientation to the Nigerian youth in terms of the tenor of what the Nigerian society is all about. They are sent to different parts of the country where they learn new things, languages, culture, food or culinary uh, differences. Some even find their wives or spouses during the NYC. So scrapping such a program in my own bull opinion will really not make sense. Simply because you think you might be concerning some resources from it. By the time you do it, you may not train the baby out of the bathroom town or cutting your own nose in order to spice yourself. It is ill advised. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a direction in which you should not go or contemplate. Okay. Uh, from uh, the Daily Trust, we are moving to The Guardian, and so many headlines here. Um, federal government in deregulation dilemma as 24% inflation worsens poverty. Uh, we also have a story, pedestrians flee as miscreants take over food bridges in Lagos, which means miscreants are increasing and they are getting more and more hungry. Fresh concerns over cost relevance of NYSC, which we have just treated now. Uh, federal government applies to withdraw firearm charge against MFLA. But I'd like us to begin uh, with Nigerians may wait longer for Tinubu's cabinet despite hasty screening. So the ministers, uh, the, go uh, the president sent in a list of would-be ministers before the deadline, sent in another list after the deadline, and now it is possible, according to this report, that we might have to wait for a longer period of time before we see who a minister is and who is not a minister. Uh, are we having a deja vu of the 2015? Because it's already three months. June, July, this is August, three months already, and counting. So what are your thoughts, if we have to wait more? And let me quickly say that uh, the federal government, Mr. President, has already fallen foul of the law. What the law says is that uh, you might we must have inaugurated your minister, your minister within or sent your use of ministers for the National Assembly or the Senate within 60 days of being thrown into office. What President Tinubu did was to send I think, 25 names and not the full complement of the ministers. The law does not emphasize that we start sending the list of ministers in batches to the Senate or to the National Assembly for confirmation. So already he has breached the law by not sending the full list of ministers to the Senate within 60 days of his attention to power. Secondly, 
they refuse to inaugurate those who have already been uh, cleared by the Senate is also an infraction of the law because, like I said, what the law emphasizes is that uh, ministers must be on ground within 60 days of the essential to power. And furthermore, it could not be impossible that the decision of Mr. President to delay the inauguration of ministers might also be related to the challenges of raising money, not just to pay the salaries and emolument and provide the comfort, so to say, for these ministers. So if the treasury is empty, like President Buhari once said when he came into power and refused to inaugurate ministers almost one year into his uh, presidency, because there was no money to do so, this present administration may also be facing the same uh, dilemma. But law is law, it has to be complied with. You could inaugurate those ministers, delay the payment of their salaries, until the situation uh, uh, improves. After all, workers at the state level, at the federal level, at the local government level, are being hold several months of salaries without uh, these workers doing anything uh, untoward as to the salaries and the monuments that they are being owed. So whichever way you look at it, it is the economy, it is the running of society, it is governance that is in Titan when ministers are not inaugurated, uh, are not inaugurated. Furthermore, with regards to inflation, which is also on the front page of uh, the Guardian, mm. it has stated that the uh, inflation is now about 24%. Four, yeah. It wasn't like that before this government came into power. So if it has jumped to 24 percent, that should be some of the reasons why the government should be eager to inaugurate the minister so that they can all get uh, uh, to work as we got tackling the myriad of uh, challenges that is facing the Nigerian uh, uh, economy. But since we have not been told the reasons for all some of these delays, Whatever we say will be mere speculation. And speculation does not replace solid facts, evidence, empirical evidence in any uh, situations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we're and for the emotional issue, yeah. I would want to say that the State Security Service is making a mockery of itself and turn a mentally into a hero. What we were told, or when they said they were going to arrest him, was that the man was funding insurgency in some part of the country. And after you have arrested him, you took him to court for, possess, for, for having him in custody. He then gone. He then gone. Hmm? Somebody you had left was funding insurgency and banditry in certain parts of the country. And you are now saying that you want to withdraw that uh, charges okay. for possession of guns. Mm. Invariably, they merely took him to court on the holding charge yeah. with the charge that uh, relates to gun, I mean, having possession of a dead gun. And under our law, it is prohibited to take somebody to court on the withholding charge. It is totally unconstitutional. That's right. When you also look at the first charges mm. that they say they want to file against them, which is a breach of procurement uh, uh, rules or no, that they made money available to one of the deputy governor of the central bank to buy a certain number of uh, vehicles. That is not within the purview of the DSS. Ordinarily, okay. it is the ICPC. <laughs> and the EFCC that should uh, be asking questions in that uh, area. It would appear to me that there is more to this MFLA issue that meets the eye. 
It is not impossible that certain persons in government okay. want to punish him <laughs> for the resignation of the Naira. Okay, let's wrap up. Let's wrap up, uh, Tunde. We, uh, this is, I'm afraid this is where we, uh, how far we can go on this uh, off the press today. We'd like to thank you, Tunde Kolaole, for coming on the program. As usually, it's a pleasure having you. Okay, that was Tunde Kolaole, a legal practitioner here in Lagos, uh, talking to us on off the press. Uh, we are going to take a short break. When we return, we'll go straight to our first hot topic. Stay with us. <laughs>